Well, let's come back. I will continue on this. Uh, for the next uh, section, I'm going to talk about it's really focus on the quality and the quality recalibration. And uh, all these things you may, I mean, if you don't read these papers, if you don't work in this area, sometimes you may not think this is necessary. But let's uh, revisit what we talk about the uh, quality. And the quality value is really this minus 10 time log base 10 of the P value. I mean, this P is, is not really P value, but that is the probability you are making a mistake. So that is uh, the general idea of this quality score, right? The probability that you are making a mistake. And then you remember we talked about all these different conversions and how to, to change it from this uh, doesn't make any sense, those letters or ASCII code back into a symbols back into the, the, the quality values. So we, we, we talk, talk about there are three levels of quality. The first one is the base quality. It's the, in your FASTQ file and it's being reported by the sequencers. And uh, meaning that uh, for every single ACGT, a sequencer has the obligation to tell you if you say this is the A, what is the opportunity I'm making a mistake, right? If Q30, that means I have 0.1% of the chance to make a mistake. That is pretty small, okay? So this base quality is reported by the sequencer, but sometimes we need to ask the question, are they really accurate? So this is a very difficult question to answer without a real positive control meaning that you know exactly what you are sequencing. In many cases, we don't, okay? Um, so this is the figure that coming from that nature genetics paper of the GATK. So you, you see here is uh, X here is the reported quality. And uh, meaning that, um, that uh, uh, if uh, it tell you Q value is 30 or 31 or 32, and that is the reported quality. And Y here is the so-called empirical quality. So, so what is empirical quality? Is uh, the mismatch of low size without a no variance, assuming everything not the same with the reference is an error. So this is a very strong assumption. In most of cases, it's wrong. But uh, to evaluate this, this is uh, what the assumption is being made. So Y here is the empirical quality. So in this case, what you are looking at is two group of dots. One is the pink, one is blue. Forget about blue at this moment, we'll come back. Just only focus on the pink ones. The pink ones are the, the, the quality, the, 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 the signals that you receive before we do the recalibration. So you can see that uh, if we lump everything from 30 to 31 into a group, and among these 30 to 31, I suppose to have 0.1% of the chance to make a mistake. And among all those sites, when I calculate uh, the empirical quality, meaning that I see how many are wrong and comparing to how many I evaluated, if I see more than 0.1%, and that means uh, that uh, the reported quality is actually better than empirical ones and better real ones. So, so you can see here is uh, everything is, uh, is a kind of a below this 45 degree line. That means uh, the empirical quality is always lower than the reported quality, meaning they're lying. They say they're, they're 0.1% make, making a mistake. Actually, they're 0.5 and it's not 0.1, right? So, so that's the, that's the part of that we need to, 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 I mean, do some further investigation. At that time, they evaluated several different sequencers and you can see this is a pretty early work. So they evaluated on the Illumina G, G, uh, genome analyzers uh, and then they have this uh, Roche 454 and uh, Life Technology Solid and the last one is the HiSeq 2000, okay? We, our current one is a high seek 4,000. But regardless, you can see that all the pink lines is kind of a below this 45 degree line. Actually, that means everybody lied, okay? 
And uh, from the different direction, if we look at this, uh, and the X here is the machine cycle. So remember that uh, if we sequence the 50 base, the first base is cycle one, cycle two, all the way to cycle 50. So we want to see that whether initially you reported something more accurate and towards the end, you kind of start to overinflate or, or it's just something universal. So you can see that uh, Y here is, if it's zero, that means uh, there's no difference between the empirical quality with the reported quality. So that is a fair, but you can see everything kind of uh, dipped into a little bit. So this means that uh, in, I mean, Illumina is being the worst uh, <laughs> of the offenders, at least from this figure. So you can see that uh, for every single cycle for the GA2, they kind of overinflated the quality they reported. And uh, for the Roche 454, they have trouble that in, the, in this region, but uh, kind of in the beginning and towards the, the middle, there's not too much uh, a problem. And the uh, solid uh, is weird, right? Solid, it, it, you see, they are not reporting very accurately, but that is not intentional. They are just uh, simply stupid. And then you can see some one day, some part they overinflated, other part they and. Uh, and, uh, and so this is uh, the Illumina High Secret 2000. So, so I mean, again, and uh, this is the machine cycle. Look at a third one, which is uh, to look at the different dinucleotides. So whether I'm, I'm just inflating all the CG I reported or AC or so, if we look at all the different dinucleotides, so you can see it's all over the places, but in general, it is uh, kind of below the zero line, meaning that uh, most of them are being overinflated. So given this, this said, and we need to acknowledge this problem. So sometimes uh, the machine reported quality is not necessarily the real quality. So we need to correct this. And this is important because if it's uh, initially, it tells you uh, Q20 and it means that you have 0.3% of making mistake, and after correction, it becomes Q20 and kind of you are, you are less confident than you think you are, right? And this uh, problem is occurring all, on all the major platforms, okay? And uh, so, so now let's uh, revisit this figure. So what is really, really causing this miscalibration, uh, 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 this uh, uh, overinflation? So in, in the figure that we're looking at, actually we are looking for three different uh, factors. So the first one is what is the, the reported quality? So maybe 30 or 40, they kind of are different. Uh, I mean, the inflation level is different. So, so the first factor is uh, kind of look at what is the reported quality. The second uh, is the position in the rate that is uh, affiliated to the cycle. And the third one is uh, what is the previous nucleotide or after the, the nucleotide following it, and that is uh, more of the uh, on the this uh, uh, dinucleotide thing, right? So, so these are three factors that we need to consider, and uh, there is also other possibilities of misalignment and uh, and other factors involved as well. So now we we see this problem. So the question is how to correct it. Uh, what they are proposing in this publication is you can read this, uh, but uh, they look at the three covariates and then using this uh, equation. Okay, this will be in the exam. No, this won't be. Um, and uh, but but the general point is just for you easier to understand. I know that when you put it in this figure, and uh, that will trigger some allergic effect on some people. Um, so I'm trying to make this simple. All right, let's uh, go back to, I made a cartoon to, to do this. So this is uh, your original reported quality for one sequencing rate, okay? So how to do the recalibration? So what they did is uh, they actually look at uh, for every single base, for everything that reported, let's say 30, and then they calculated the empirical quality. Let's say 27, average is 27. So, okay. So now I know for if they reported at 30, 
is supposed to be 27. Okay, so basically you have this delta QR, which is uh, the differences in the reported quality comparing to the empirical one at the time that they reported this uh, as the 30th score. Okay, so this one you can do the calculation across the entire genome. Okay, and then the next part is uh, you can see this is as R, which is the reported quality, and C, which cycle it is in. Okay, so now let's look at uh, the fifth cycle, for example, and then we see that uh, for all these, what are need to be further recalibrated, and then you can do the make those calculation and then add this up a little bit. And the last one is to look at the dinucleotides. The nucleotide part they didn't really care about uh, the cycle; rather, they only look at uh, the 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 quality being reported. So you can calculate from all the data, calculate this part, and then you do the further correction. So all these are just individual correction that you are trying to, uh, you calculate from the, uh, the whole thing added together, okay? And by the end of the day, this is your recalibrated quality, okay? So let me give you one example on this. So one base, there your, your reported quality is 20. Okay, they tell you it's 20. So you're making the conclusion, the chance you make a mistake is 0.1%. But when you look at the experiment across all the positions, you found that the average empirical quality for all the base they reported at 30 actually is 25. Okay, then your delta QR will be minus five. So you know that you are going to give a dip in this region, okay? So next, and you look at the base located in the fifth location of the base, which means the, the number five, cycle number five, and in the red, the average empirical quality for all the base with the reported quality 30. So you need, a, it's a reported as 30 at the same time, it's the fifth base. And then there are actually, uh, the quality is 27. Actually, you said it's 25. Okay, now I kind of corrected too much. So let's give it a little more credit back. So it's a, it become a plus two. So that's why you are, I'm putting plus two here. So next one is um, the dinucleotide of all the sequences result is GCG and, uh, and the, the average empirical quality for the base with reported quality of 30 and at the same time is CG is actually 23. And that means uh, with, uh, with 25 reported, you didn't correct enough. So you get a minus two. So by adding all this together, by the end of the day, your recalibrated quality for if they reported as 30, it's the fifth nucleotide in the read, and it is a CG dinucleotide. And then after correction, your empirical quality will be zero, recalibrated quality will be 25. And then now you know actually the chance you are making a mistake is 0.3%. Questions? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, All right, go to figure it out, and it's written in the notes, so you should be able to. Um, but the point here is uh, after this recalibration, so you can see it becomes the blue dots. So everything in the first panel, it goes to 45 degree line, meaning that empirical and the reported quality and the recalibrated quality, they are the same now. And it's, it's good. So this one, you can see it goes, all goes to zero and the third one all goes to zero line. So meaning that this general strategy did a good job in terms of doing this recalibration. And I'm giving you the example only selected three variables. Actually, there are many more covariates that is involved. And uh, the good news is uh, we do not need to write the program to do this. It's also all in the GATK package. So you see that if you really want to design a tool to be generally widely used and making a real impact in the field, and it's a lot of work to get all through this, okay? And again, this is only part of the JTK package, okay? So this is uh, the, the 
uh, recalibration for the base quality part. Any questions so far? Okay. Just uh, you have to follow me. And the reason for that is we might have a quiz at the end of the class talking about the stuff we talk about in the class today. I'm not saying we will, uh, that we might, and, uh, and we have done that before in the past. So just you need to follow me a little bit on that, okay? So the next part is uh, I want to go through is, uh, is important as well. I mean, everything is important. But this is, uh, is uh, related to the variant identification, okay? So now we, we, we deal with, uh, they give me a fast kill file, and then I have so many sequence alignment aligned back to the genome. And now next step is how I'm going to identify variants. Okay, so let's see why this is an issue. It's, 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 it's easy, right? So you see, this is a reference genome. There's an A here. And then in this case, uh, most of the rays that supporting this is a G. I know immediately that this is a homozygous variant, that this is a G. And this is a, a C, supposed to be a sequencing error. Don't worry about that. And this it seems it's fine. It's a homozygous variance location. And in another condition, this is the heterozygous. So I'm having 11 rays here, 5G, 6A, and, uh, and we know it's a heterozygous variance. So it's supposed to be simple. There's a, no math is required, it seems to, to us. But, Actually, it's not that simple. So, and, and, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, how to call a variant, so if we have 10G, 0A, we know it's homozygous. If we have 5G, 6A, we know it's a heterozygous. But what if it's 9, 2? Is that still homozygous? What about it's 6 and 5? Yeah, this is still heterozygous. Well, 8, 3 become a little difficult too to make a decision. Seven, four become a little difficult to make decision. So at a certain point, we have this boundary that we cannot necessarily make a decision properly. At this time, the statistics will start to kick in, right? And uh, so now let's see what are the factors to be considered. So first of all, it will be the number of rates supporting each genotype. And uh, when we talk about each genotype, it's going to be a or G, right? So you can see for this one is a 10 versus a zero or six versus five. The second one we need to consider to do this is going to be the base quality for each nucleotide, right? Because some of them, if I, I'm, I'm saying this is a C, for example, and that my base quality is really, really low. So meaning that the sequencer doesn't sure, is not sure whether it's a C or not. And uh, in that case, uh, although they give me the best guess, I probably will consider this base a little bit less. Alignment quality for each rate. Okay, so I'm seeing here is uh, there is a few rates that uh, have a mismatch. What if that race doesn't supposed to be there? What if I talk about macrobility in the very earlier, what if there are some of the new uh, region that is very similar to here, this is simply a misalignment. So the mapping quality, alignment quality needs to be considered. The sequencing depth needs to be considered. If I have 30 rates to support this region, I don't have much more confident uh, comparing to another region, I have only two rates, right? And then the sequencing arrow, machine related arrows, uh, and, uh, but, but whatever we need to consider all this, uh, bottom line is uh, what, what we need, uh, the outcome we need is uh, the probability for each of the three genotypes. If we are talking about a haplotype genome, we have only AA, homozygous reference, heterozygous, which is AG in this situation, or homozygous variance. So only one of these three. That makes sense? So basically, we want to make a decision based on the read we identified, what are the likelihood of three genotypes? Okay, so now we'll come to something called the Bayesian-based approach. And, uh, and uh, the Bayesian inference is a method of statistical inference in which evidence is used to update the uncertainty of parameters and the predictions in the probability model. I know that. Yeah. So, so the bottom line is uh, 
you have a, a equation and you have a couple of parameters you want to decide and you don't know what the parameters are. In our case, that parameter is uh, which genotype it is. We don't know, okay? And then we have the data being measured. And then we want to see is uh, what are the parameters that fit into the data. We use the data to infer the parameters inside the, our original uh, question. So that is the base and base approach. So usually you have a start from a model, you derive the data, but in our case, we do not have the model, right? That model, which is which genotype it is, is something I want to measure. What I do is I have the data, which is the reads, and then I want to come back to measure. That's the base and base approach, okay? For variant identification, our model is one of these three genotypes, which one it is our data is the sequencing rates. Okay, so, so those are our rates. So in this case, uh, and you probably eventually we will observe to say for AA, and it's very little possibility, it is uh, AA because for this position we see all of them are G, right? And a very small possibility is AG, and because we didn't see any A really, and uh, we have a huge probability it's GG. And uh, so actually this is uh, the, the, the result we want to derive. Okay, so now let's say the equations uh, uh, to get there. So sometimes it can be complicated. In this case, it's actually not. So let's go through this a little bit, just to lead you through the, the, the thinking process. In reality, it's much more complicated than this, right? So if we are looking at one locus, one position, okay, and that there is a, N rays, let's say 50 rays. And then you have K rays support A. The K rays, there's an A here. And the N minus K rays support G. So that is the observation, that is the data. So you have three possible genotypes, okay? If this is a GG, okay, if this is our data, if this is the AA, if this is our data, what that really means is uh, I'm observing n minus k rays supporting G. These are sequencing error. If the, the genome genotype is AA and this supporting G is sequencing error. So you are going to have n minus k errors in the rays that you are observing. Does that make sense? Okay. So in that case, actually you can think uh, what, what are the chance that I, I'm going to make that mistake? And the second one is uh, if this is AG, now it becomes binomial model, right? So you have two alleles and you have so many rays. Some of them are here. It's like you, you flip a coin. And every time you finish one, it's like you grab a race. You can either grab the A allele or grab the G allele, right? So that is a 50-50 chance. So now become a binomial model. So in theory, you are grabbing K rays support A, N minus K rays support G is actually following this binomial distribution. That's the probability. If this is the AG is the genotype, you are going to observe this many rays. If you are observing GG, if GG is your genotype, and that, but actually you observe this, that means that there are K nucleotide, you made a sequencing error. That makes sense? Okay, so basically that's the thinking process. And then you will lump into the prior of uh, what are the possibilities uh, of uh, different genotypes because uh, uh, truthfully, you have a larger chance for every single genomic location, you have a larger chance to be a homozygous than be a heterozygous. So, so that's why that uh, for the heterozygous, the probability is uh, R. And then for the homozygous one, the prior probability will be one minus R divided by two, okay? And then this is, uh, again, when people use a base and base approach, the problem is uh, how to decide that this prior. And uh, it's a very difficult question. And uh, there is no proper way to do it. You just have to give it a number, like the, the model to take over. Uh, and the general rule here, here is uh, usually R is predefined, and uh, for 
if for known SNP locations that will decide R as 0 0.2, and for unknown low size, because there will be le much less chance there is a heterozygous variant, and we will give the prior R is 0 0.001. So that is basically the way that people do that, okay? And of course, I think all these models, if you drill into deeper, you have a way to change all those settings. And then once you have this, and then you, you will see that uh, uh, based on your, 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 the, the posterior probability will be, I mean, this equation put together. So this is a kind of the base and base approach. Uh, if you don't understand, don't worry about that. That's okay. Uh, but by the end of the day, the variant quality will be uh, minus 10 log 10 as a base, one minus the probability you are making mistake. Okay? So, so this is, uh, in terms of the variant called the most simplified version are like this, people are doing in this way. So there is uh, additional comments about this uh, methodology. And, but, but what I want you to understand, I, I know that you're probably getting a little confused, uh, is, um, is really you have three options of the genotype, A, 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 G, or G, G, for, every, for this particular location. And then based on the data, you just want to calculate what is the most the highest probability genotype model. So if the first is the genotype, what's the probability I, I observe this data? If the second is the real genotype, what's the probability? And lump this together to make your most educated uh, estimation. So that is uh, the general idea of this variant call. So this method only works for deployed genomes. And uh, we should, when we do the, some germline mutation identification for humans, and that is, uh, is a good one. And, uh, and it requires substantial coverage for each genomic loci. So because every time that when we use this type of, usually initially we, we want uh, every single nucleotide to have larger than 20 to 30x coverage. And uh, because we need to have enough evidence, enough risk to support there is a heterozygous or homozygous variance. Just to give you an example, if for one location you have only two rays, so one say this is reference, one say this is alternative, you wouldn't be able to tell whether that alternative is real or not, okay? The chance is it's not real, it's just sequencing error. But if you have 20 rays, you have 10 say it's the reference, 10 say it's alternative. Now you have much more data to make that educated uh, uh, estimation. So, so that is, uh, so basically you, it requires a substantial coverage for each genomic location. But unfortunately, this is not necessarily the case. In many cases, this is not. How many of you know that for the initial thousand genomes project, what is the coverage they did? Give a guess. Huh? 30? Any other? Less than 10? I, I'm, if you give a range, that's not fair. <laughs> Le less than a thousand, you are certainly right. <laughs> no, but, but actually you're, you're right. 4x coverage. Okay, so meaning that for each genomic location, they only covered by average four times. Average means a lot of locations are less than four, right? So, but they are still trying to figure out what's, I mean, back in those days, the sequencing cost, I mean, sequencing cost is much higher. And uh, to sequence a thousand, they eventually to 2,500 individuals, it's not a trivial thing. So, and how they are going to do it, right? And so there's a low to moderate sequencing coverage. This won't work. So the strategy I told you will not work. And this will lead lead to undercalling heterozygous. So meaning that if there's a heterozygous location, in many cases, you wouldn't have enough confidence. If you have only four rays, you see two references, two alternative, you cannot say this is a heterozygous variance. You don't know whether that two alternative are the ones that actually you did a sequencing error, even sometimes it's three, one, that you've got even bigger trouble, right? And uh, so one, 
So one assumption of this general approach that I just talked about is also independent, uh, independence among rays, which may be violated in the presence of alignment error or PCR artifacts. So meaning that, uh, so th that is, this is a caveat of, of the approach I, I told you, is they treat each individual race as independent. So meaning that if I observe 50 uh, race and the 25A, 25G, I'm assuming those are random 25 sampling. Okay, how do you know that G is not coming from just one and then you did PCR artifacts? You did, those are coming from the original same nucleotide and then because of the PCR and the, it's unfairly amplified that particular rate for some reason or, I mean, those are the things that need to be considered as well, right? So, so this is an assumption that we need to also keep in mind. All right. So now we were coming to this problem. So for, for the thousand genome, when, when they did only four X coverage, how they can also confidently call the variants of those 1,000 individuals, All right? So now we should revisit this particular uh, scenario or strategy. And there is one important part in this, which is that R, that prior we said, which mean in the case that we assume that a heterozygous variant is R and the homozygous variant is one minus R divided by two. And this R is being dictated by whether this position have a known SNP or not. Okay. This R, can be actually estimated from a larger population, right? We don't have to set a number. So let's say that if I have a thousand individuals sitting there, their genomes I already know, okay, for the other 999, I already know. And there's a lot of variants in, a lot of people carry the variant in that location. Okay, so now I, for me, I only sequence the four rays, okay, 2A, 2G. I, I wasn't sure whether that G is sequencing error or not. However, among the other 999 people, 400 of them have a G allele in that. So now I have a much better chance, I say, this G is real. It's, it's written in my DNA. It's not a sequencing error because it's not a, a, a very high chance that the other 900 people, they also observe the same sequencing error. So meaning that at this point, we are looking at if based on this particular individual, based on the reads we got, we do not have enough information, but we still want to have more statistical power. What do we do? We borrow information from other places. And the first way to borrow is let's look at the other 900 people whether they have a variant or not. And if they do, I'm increased my, my confidence. Does that make sense? That's the first direction they borrowed it. The second direction they borrowed is uh, borrow the information from my own DNA. How do I do that? Right? So remember I talked about haplotypes. Our DNA in this location and then 100 base downstream of my location is linked, right? So they are kind of, uh, they are in the LD region. So if I see that one is an A, I have a higher chance to say I have a G here. So, so that is kind of borrowing the information across the genome of my own, okay? In that case, and I'm not only borrowing from the other 900 people, we also borrow the C this information. So now my reads number is no longer four, okay? So I, when I lump in my, my neighbor SNAP, my read number become eight because we got four over there as well, right? And then we will look at that direction, we got, we got another four, right? So let's lump everybody's together and then make that adjustment. Adjustment. So, so basically every time in, in terms of statistics, this is a generic thing, this is not only for the sequencing. So if you want to improve your statistical power, 
the only thing you, you can do is to either grab more data into it or borrow the data from somewhere or chip in your biological knowledge into it. So once you do that, you have a way to increase your statistical power. Okay, so basically this R can be actually estimated. So this is, uh, by the way, I made all these figures, okay? This is not coming from the GAPK paper. Uh, so, so basically for one's individual locations, so you can see individual one have four rays, four rays, individual two have four rays, and then you have a thousand individuals. So each one, you can have a genotype likelihood calculated, and then, what we can do is actually, at this point, based on everything, let's uh, have a, a meeting, consortium, or a conference summit, or whatever, right? Let's see this location, whether it is possible to have a variant. If there is, okay, let's go back uh, to fix your own estimation, and then we come back again, and uh, with some more, much better results. So this is uh, the way that the thousand genome worked. If you look at, if you look at uh, the GATK paper, and there's another 50 lines of equations, which I cannot go through, and I honestly, I, I don't understand either. But so the equation is, is very, very complicated. If you really want to challenge yourself in that aspect, then uh, you're welcome to read that paper, okay? But in general, that is how it works. Does that make sense? So, yes. In the thousand genomes, when they have, yes, that's a really good question. So when they have the uh, trails, and they, they, they do in include the, the parents into it. Actually, that is a better way to get the facing information in. So if you have the little kid, the, 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 the child of the two parents, right? And then for this position is a heterozygous, this position is a heterozygous, actually, based on whatever their parents' nucleotide is, and they can see which two are in the same allele, actually. So yes, those, those information are being considered in the, in the calculation. Uh, but that is only when you, you, you have the, the trail information, both parents and the, the child, uh, you can do that. But that's a, that's a great question. But you can see, so this is uh, from their paper, I think uh, it's a, it's, it should be a JTK paper. But if you look at uh, their power, uh, the accuracy, that uh, based on only one single sample, and then this is based on multiple samples together, and this is based on Beagle. Beagle is a, a, um, a, a, a haplotype tool. So basically, they lump multiple location into together. So you can see eventually, they were really, by lumping all those information, their accuracy can reach to 95%. So it's, a, it's a very, very impressive, okay. Does that make sense? So that's for the deep the genome, right? So, okay. So it, when we talk about a non deep genome, for example, for cancer genome, which means only a small proportion of the cells that change, and, uh, and uh, or for pool sequencing, for RNA sequencing, meaning it's no longer deep the genome anymore. Our initial model doesn't work anymore. It's a strict type of genotypes. And uh, so meaning that if we are looking at this figure, we can say, okay, there are one of the two things. If this is a diploid genome, and then if I observe this pattern, my conclusion could be this is a homozygous G, and this particular A is a sequencing error, right? Because it's 50-50 chance, right? If it's a somatic mutation, my conclusion here could be this one is a novel mutation. It's a one, maybe a few percentage of the cells mutated. Okay, it could also be sequencing error, but it's, it, it can be the real biology. So if it's a put sequencing, my conclusion here could be there are, I mean, among the 10 people that you, you put together, one of them has a mutation, which is A. 
and the other nine is G. And if it's an RNA sequencing, my interpretation for that is could be it's a heterozygous variant that has both A and the G, but the G allele expresses much more than A allele. So you can see that uh, whatever I told you before, for the past 20 slides also, talking about the variant identification and things like that, it is simply for deployed genome. That is our bottom line, right? So with different uh, biological design, for the same thing, for the same data, you will be able to derive very, very different conclusions. And this is actually why I'm talking about this could be a very good exam question. Do you think so? <laughs> yeah. I need to make a notes after this. And this, is, this can be a very good, I mean, making sure you understand it. Oh. So given this sad, that everything that uh, 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 for th these individual scenarios, there will be a, another series of tools that uh, are being defined or designed to figure out all these problems that we, we are not having time to talk about those. Okay, so the, for the summary for the variant identification part is, uh, is uh, the methods of identifying variants from sequencing data vary, and uh, for different type of biological questions, uh, and there are different set of tools that, uh, that their, their options are, okay? Any questions so far? Ready for the quiz? No? All right, let's don't do that. Don't do that to you guys, okay? So now let's uh, move on uh, to, to still focus on the variant identification, but uh, this is a, a slightly different point, is to do the variant quality recalibration, okay? So now we're talk not talking about the base quality was being lied by the sequencers. We're not talking about that anymore. So this is something that uh, how do we, when I call there's a variant, there's a statistical term affiliate to it, right? I have a Q value that is indicating what our percentage chance I made a mistake. But is that estimation really accurate? So let's uh, revisit this a little bit. How do we do this? So, after variant identification, we will identify a lot of variants, okay? Or if you did whole genome sequencing, that could be uh, a few million, three million variants. Whole exome sequencing, anywhere from 30 to 40,000 variants. Many of them are real, but others are not, okay? And there's a many different source of those errors. It could be machine or chemistry-related errors. Could be our, our, our analysis errors. For example, we, we, we alignment is, didn't do very well. And each variant, actually, if you, you go through it, it has many different variables, okay? That is including the variant quality, which I just told you the equations to calculate that. Right? I didn't really go into too much detail, but we will have a quality, okay? And, but we also have others, like a, the DAPS coverage. So for one region, that uh, if I have uh, 10 rates, and uh, sometimes if I only do this for one genome, and I don't have another thousand put people I can borrow from, and then if, uh, I mean, I'm designed as a 30x coverage, but for some locations it's going to be five, others, uh, maybe a hundred, so it's, it's not going to be that even, right? So sometimes I need to give a coverage cutoff, say I'm not going to believe anything that is lower than 10x coverage, okay? That is your decision to make. I'm not suggesting you to make it, but that's the decision to make. There's a strand bias, so what that means is if it's a DNA variant, Hypothetically, you will observe that from positive strand rays. So you remember some rays will go positive strand, others go negative strand, right? So to go to the positive strand rate, and uh, you, if it's 50-50, you want to see that 50% of the positive strand rate carry that, and 50% of negative strand rate carry it, if it's the real DNA variance, right? So if you, you are seeing all your reported variants are from in one strand, not from the other strand, that it, the chance is that it's not right. So, so there is a way that we can calculate the strand bias. 
And so there are many of these things. So variant quality, there are many different scores, strand bias, depth coverage, and the mapping quality. So for every single location that we are looking at, there will be many, many parameters to go into. So now you are seeing here is that there is actually two, cut, two distributions in each of these measurements. So one is, uh, is uh, this uh, purple, which is uh, the variant that we identified, but they are also occurring in the DB snake. So, which means that those are the variant that not only identified in my genome, but there is a previous record suggesting they are there. Okay. So, in most of the cases, we will think they are more likely to be correct. So, you can see that, for example, for the variant quality, you are seeing these two peaks of these purple ones. And I'm not talking about the red ones on top of it, it's purple ones underneath. So, this is going to be a homozygous variant. This is the heterozygous variants, but they are kind of uh, the DB SNF confirmed that they are existing in human genome. And uh, for this distribution, it's going to be the novel ones we identified. So basically, only identified in my genome, and it hasn't been seen elsewhere. Okay, and you can see these two distributions that can be very very different. And then now, next question is uh, how we can lump all this information together to really make a best way to de decide whether we believe in this uh, variant or not. Okay, so the good thing of, it, of this is uh, all of these different criteria, like the mapping quality and the depth of coverage and it's like, oh my God, I have to go through so many information for every genomic location. That is a big trouble. The good news is uh, all of them almost all of them are already in the VCF file, which we'll talk about in the second lecture, okay? So they are already in the VCF files. So before we had the GATK or, or this type of uh, algorithm, so what we do is the common strategy to do this is uh, I identify the 40,000 variants, and then I will use many different cutoffs for every single variant, for example, I do not trust anything that a Q value is less than 20. Okay, I don't want to make more than 1% of mistake. And the strand bias p-value needs to be less than 0 0.05. The depth coverage needs to be larger than eight. The, this RMS is, I think it's a root mean square, something like that. So, so basically that is related to the, to the mapping quality needs to be larger than 20, and so on and so forth. So, so I have so many different things I, I need to make a decision on every single location. So this is a, usually my, our common practice, even now, in many cases, this is what we do, right? We calculate a, a, a Q value for the, and then we, we want to see whether the coverage in, is enough, whether the sequence are too biased and things like that. So we, we do all, all these different, uh, different cutoffs. There are many parameters and to make the decision, it's very arbitrary. And there's no consistent uh, guideline to do that. So the quite better way to solve this is going to be assign one well-calibrated probability based on all this to this particular variant. Now we still need to make one, make a decision, but we only need to make one decision based on this new score. So that is the general idea of doing that. So the question is, how do we do this? And the, basically, they are doing is training a high confidence known size to determine the probability that other size are true. So what that means is, for every single genomic location, I have a bunch of parameters, okay? Variant, sequencing depth, mapping quality, and all this, okay? Remember, we have quite a few that is uh, known before. It's in the DB snake. They are more likely to be right. Okay. So our strategy here is uh, how can we learn from that their distributions, and then if we can figure that out, we will train the machine, and then for the every novel variance of mine, 
I'm going to go through this machine and calculate the probability. But this probability is going to be based on all these individual variant, uh, variant size. That makes sense? So based on all these parameters, trying and based on the, the good ones, we know they are good ones because they are documented before, and then trying to figure out what's the best distribution I can make this decision. So, so the gold standard is annotated variance, and in, in the past that it is being identified. And our, the model they use is called a variational Bayesian Gaussian mixture model. And they say it's just a looking at the distribution and then to make a decision. And uh, we're going to skip this. Um, uh, here, so here is uh, the, what the result look like. So you can see that, uh, um, let me see. There are two panels, apparently, okay. So, so this is our training data sets. So meaning that these are the variants uh, that is in the DB SNP. Okay, now we're only looking at two parameters. Eventually, we need to look at all the parameters that we're interested in, okay? The two parameters is, the first one is the, the variant quality score, okay? The second parameter is the evidence for strand bias. We don't want to have strand bias, right? So the evidence for strand bias, the lower, the better, and then for this part, the variant quality, the higher, the better. So you can see those are all good ones. Now I'm seeing for this two parameter plot together, we see this large, two large cohorts. Actually, this is a homozygous variance. This is a heterozygous variance. And there is a few of this that the variant quality is not very good and the strand bias is pretty severe. So these are more likely to be the false positives. So even some variance in the DB SNP doesn't mean I have to have it, right? So I have more confidence to say I might have it, but that doesn't necessarily to be the case. So these are, are probably either DB SNP errors or it's in DB SNP but not in my genome. So you can see this. So the general idea is they were trying to look at this distribution and then learn a model and then use that on the novel variants being identified, on every single novel variants being identified. So you are seeing that in the real one, there's a, a bunch of homozygous variants. And this is the same distribution as here. This is a heterozygous variants. But you see a much denser population here. And these are the chances that those are wrong predictions. So they are not variants. So based on all these putting together, they will be able to give one single score, unified score for this variance based on all those parameters. And then our decision will be based on that particular one. Okay, we need to take another break and we'll come back with uh, uh, five, 455.